If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of the Mind Pump. This is like an oldie. <laughs> the Mind Pump show. This is like an oldie. It yeah. is. We uh, we didn't have- it's a classic style. We didn't have a uh, direction when we opened up this episode, but it, it turned into a great topic. Uh, well, we started off by, you know, doing our normal bullshitting. We talked about Instagram and the changing market for nudes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. Doug's bullet point. Yep. <laughs> changing market for nudes. We talked about London cracking down on knives over three inches long. Yeah, hide stop. those butter knives. Hide those butter knives. We talked about sucralose and Crohn's disease and also how sucralose may actually not only kill good bacteria, but promote the growth of bad bacteria Watch out for that shell game. Double whammy. Yeah. Uh, we talk about how there's no bad fats found in nature. We love all those natural fats. Stole that from Max. Yeah, we did. Thanks, Max Lugavere. Um, and then we got into kind of our main topic. You know, Adam asked me about a blog that I had written on the breakdown recovery trap. Great blog. Now this is you know it's a trap. I, I had to uh, throw that in there. Oh, that's a yeah, good one. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the breakdown recovery trap. It's a term I, you know, we came up with a long time ago. And, and basically, this is what it means. You go to the gym. You get really sore. You wait a week. Let your muscle recover, heal. It no longer hurts anymore. Go back to the gym. Follow the same process. But every time you work out, no more progress. No progress. You're not getting stronger. You're not building any muscle. It's called the breakdown recovery trap because you break your muscle down, recover, break it down, recover, no progress whatsoever. Now, in the show notes, you're going to be able to go wheels. right to this, right? So we're going to put this in the show notes. Yeah, you'll be able to go to the blog and, and, and read a little bit more about it. But we talk a lot about it in this episode as well, so they're, they're, they're nice companions. I suggest you obviously listen to the blog, uh, excuse me, listen to the podcast, and then read the blog, and you'll get the most information that way. Also, this month, I am so shocked at how, how well, I guess I'm not shocked. This is one of our most popular promotions. Um, we're giving away the No BS six-pack formula for free. This is a workout designed specifically for your midsection. I guess everybody's trying to get ready for summer, right? Everybody yeah. wants a, a six-pack. <laughs> We're giving it away for free. Shirts are flying off. If you enroll in any bundle, bundles are when we take more than one MAPS program and we put them together and we discount them by like 20 to 30% off uh, the original retail price. So it's a great deal if you ask me. Again, free, no BS six-pack with any bundle or you can get individual MAPS programs all available on our site, mindpumpmedia.com. You know what I'm starting to see get real popular on Instagram? What? Uh, pages that are not human. Like people's oh, bots. pets. No, people's oh, pets. Pet. Oh, uh, yeah. I get My boys have a page. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. yeah. Mozzie and Bentley are on their way to fame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you're like you know you're like you're, you just you're like those parents that put their kids they put yeah. their kids hey, in show business. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was really hesitant. I was really hesitant to do it because I don't know what it's get gonna, them an agent. It's gonna hurt my ego when they pass me. Uh, <laughs> oh, they they will. Yeah, yeah, so, why would you? Yeah. They're way cuter. Yeah. No, it's like, it's like those people that put their kids in show business to get famous. You know yeah. Right? yeah. Put your dog until your dog takes you. The to next court. thing you know, they're on cocaine and you know just doing crazy <laughs> stuff. Put, you imagine you gotta a dog be careful. Doing, you don't want a dog doing, especially a bulldog no. doing cocaine. No, what right. I see that's crazy right now is, I mean, we've seen this since Instagram started, and it's more and more popular. Are the you know pages of girls that are pretty much naked? I mean, I can't. I didn't realize how much you can get away with. I like on where we're going. Instagram. With this. Yeah, no, I've never seen those pages, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> You're telling me on Instagram there's pages of <laughs> well, I was that's to, most of them. I, I was think. talking to Katrina about this the other day, and I'm like, you know what's crazy, like, or it's or it's crazy for me, I guess at least, and I guess I'm dating myself here, but to see, the, I mean, my thread is flooded full of these because, of course, I follow these all these pages because <laughs> it's you know it's business related. I'm thinking like, okay, these girls have built big, large pages. I gotta do my research on exactly what they're doing. Did you so. follow these pages before Mind Pump? Yeah. Anyway, continue. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the idea. That's how that's how Mike, if it wasn't for all those pages, we wouldn't have been on the build mind pump to yeah. where it is today. So Exactly. Thank you, exactly. all you Instagram models, for helping me out with the algorithm. Thanks, exactly. Jojo. No, so really though, a lot of them, what they do, it's um it's like it's like modern day um prostitution. Yeah. Well, it, well, you mean pornography? Oh, wait no, a minute! You're talking no, about no. the ones that it's actually—it's like, like modern day prostitution, and or I, I guess kind of like pornography too. I mean, 
you get a lot of them build up a large following. They get hundreds of thousands of followers, some of them millions, right? And then they have a Patreon page, mm. but it's not like an, it's not just give them money or that. They have these pages that, and so they they put the pictures on the Instagram. Now Instagram doesn't allow you to show nipples or clit or anything like that. So you, you they, they put like a, <laughs> a little, little more than that, but yeah, but a little. <laughs> no, I think you could show top of vagina. You just can't show clit. Like, no, you can't, bro. You could show. I'm everything. so careful about you, you know the see, words he uses. You can yeah. see the line and everything. Yeah, the the top of the line. The top of the line. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So oh, really. Um, so, anyways, they they blur it. They blur just that so like little bit out. Camel toes, okay. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. Just to but you have to, to add to the conversation. If you want to see full nude, you you know you go to their their whatever website they're working with, and it's like an exclusive eight, content. Yeah, eight or nine dollars a month, and now you have access to your favorite Instagram model naked all the time. And I'm not gonna lie, dude. If I was a 17 year old <laughs> boy or so. I mean, I would be invested here. So it feels okay. So it's a smart business. Strategy. So I, I'm thinking about this because I, I wasn't familiar that this was such, such a big thing. That that part of it, I know that I did know that. You, I think you might have told me that some girls will have like, there you go, but hey, if me. you want to buy me gift, no, you showed me this. <laughs> hey, if you want to buy me gifts, you know, I have like. Don't they have like where you can go and see the things that they like and then you can buy them stuff? Yeah, yeah. That, okay, that yeah. was like an Amazon wish list. Well, there's an app for that. We were down in L.A. Remember that? There's I forget the name of it. And there's they call these girls something. There's a name for these girls, where you know it's like sugar ba- babies. Yes, that's yeah, what it was. Sugar Boy, babies. you know a lot more about I, this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This guy, yeah. He sets me up and then he fires yeah. all it's the just answers. Logical. <laughs> it's just logical. If you're gonna buy so sugar mama, uh, sugar daddy. Uh, oh, sugar yeah, it's oh, just okay. yeah. Like yeah. anybody could have figured that out. Yeah. So they yeah. have that, but I'm more I'm more fascinated in these. So I mean, and I'm not hating either. I mean, these girls. It's a business. Yeah, you know. So I mean, he, these, well, some of these like girls the are web, webcam girls. I mean, this is just a natural thing that they could help to market and drive traffic towards their, you know, site, which it's, is, I, like makes them a lot of money. It's not prostitution because they're not having sex. No. So, and it's way. I think it's way better. Obviously, safer. But here's. Uh, so I'm looking at the whole market, and this is what I'm thinking. If I want to see naked pictures and stuff, that's free. It's so free and so available online that it's just it's ridiculous, right? Por- Pornographies get. I think. Sites get more visits than anything else on the internet, but these girls are still having people pay them to see their naked pictures. So what it makes me think is that they're trying to connect with these followers so that the followers feel like, oh, they know me because they answered my question once or they liked my comment. And so, cause it's different, you know, it's different to look at pictures of a, imagine this, imagine if you're watching porn and then you, you see a girl and you're like, wait a minute, that's the waitress that always serves me. You know, coffee at the, every morning at the at the coffee shop. It's way more exciting because you feel like you oh, because you know them, right? Yeah. Or they might even have interact. A lot of these girls are smart. They interact That's with what their I mean. with their audience. It's they no, talk it's, to them. it's no different than any of the social media business, <laughs> except it, they're selling. You know, right, but I, it's smarter. I mean, Jesus, are you kidding drop me? the supplements for sex? That's what, imagine a seventeen a seventeen year old boy like you were. It was like getting a hold of a Playboy magazine. We've talked about this before. It was like gold, right? It was a, such a big deal. But you're flipping through a magazine of girls that you've never seen in your life and probably never will see in your life, right? Or uh, definitely not. Commu- communicate with if i had the ability to actually follow them on instagram and text them and they're messaging back and everything like that and then i'm also getting to see nudes and it's only costing me like 7.99 a month like so i had a situation i would be really if someone is a mind pump listener and you're like you're into this business i'd be so intrigued by the type of revenue that you can make based off of how many followers which is I mean, why you're actually in a relationship at that point yeah. right <laughs> basically <laughs> like you're you're my girlfriend which is why we are creating like, introduce a, you to mom. a separate instagram page for justin because we think there's money. They yeah. think there's millions there. There's a lot of money in those cakes. And the, wow. There's, there's, those cakes are worth quite... We have them I'm insured, I'm going to start doing it. those crush videos. Yeah. Oh. They're just like smash stuff between my cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll At, Adam's hand. There might we'll, be a market for We'll that. have Sal do the, the, the butt shots. What do they call those oh. out there? Where they, yeah. You pour the waterfall the down thing. your backside and so, Sal takes a shot of it. So what we're, Snort some what we're talking about there. reminds me of this. So only one time did I ever run into a situation where I, I saw someone naked who I knew outside of, you know, that, that particular sphere or whatever. And it caught me off guard. So I went, let's see, <laughs> God, I remember, I'm trying to remember which club I was managing. It might've been, uh, the 24 hour on Sunnyvale. So I'm managing a club. I'm like, I don't know, 20 maybe. And my staff always used to go out like once a week, my staff would go party and hang out, whatever. And I never really wanted to with them because I, I thought, oh, if I cross that line, it might not be a good idea. There was a couple of them that I would go out with, but not not too many, uh, not all of them. Plus, I was only 20, so I couldn't really get going anywhere, right? I wasn't old enough to drink. Right. But strip clubs, I was old enough. So I remember one particular closeout, we did really, really well. 
Um, we broke some records or something. And my guys, my sales guys were like, we're taking you out. So they took me to a strip club and they're like, do, you know, uh, do you Naturally. ever, yeah, they're like, you ever go to, you ever go to the, you know, strip clubs where I was like, ah, I, I went to like no, one when I was like weird. 18. Like He's I never, all, yeah. I'm way too good looking for that. True. He says, yeah. other people. no, which is true. I never, I, I think at this point I'd only gone to a strip club maybe once or twice in my entire life. Like once when I was 18 and I think that was it. So we walk in and the girl that's on stage that's dancing was a girl that I used to train when I was a trainer when I was 18. Wow. Oh, wow. It was this this Asian girl. She was super shy when I trained her. She would giggle a lot. You know, sweet girl. She was, a, you know, moderately attractive. We walk in and she's there on stage. She sees me. She runs down and gives me a big hug. So now everybody's like- A naked hug? She had, she, at this point, she wasn't fully naked. That's yet. awesome. Naked hug. Yeah, at this yeah. point, she yeah. wasn't fully naked. Score. She runs Not down. A lot of guys get those. You she, know? Yeah. Oh, she goes, literally, oh my God, Sal. She runs down, gives me a hug. Of course, now my staff's looking at me like, oh, you've only come here. You've never come here before? <laughs> yeah, but you know my name. <laughs> I look like a regular, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And she she brought me to the stage and They're does this, this whole like new dance for me, and it was the most- Amazing time ever. And awkward. You know what I mean? Because it was uh, like someone I knew. Well, was she awkward about it or was she actually stoked? No, she was excited. Well, there you yeah, go. Yeah, and I, was, I wasn't I was excited till later. You know yeah, I mean? that's- I was it, too nervous. Dude, I remember when we- So one of the trainers, we like showed me and we realized the trainer that had worked with us was like in a porno and it just blew my mind. <laughs> I was like, I know who this is. This is crazy. <laughs> you talking uh, about somebody who worked for me? Yes. Yeah, you know okay. who it is. Yeah, of course I know yeah. who it is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. have any stripper stories. Write down yet. her We're name here. on a piece That's of paper. That's the only one we know. But uh, yeah, that was that. That was weird, man. Yeah, accidental it porn. It happens. Accidental porn or un, un, uh, what is it? <clears throat> Unexpected. Unexpected. I just Unexpected. think it. I think it's interesting to see see where it's going, and I'm sure there's a huge market for it. What I'm seeing now too, which is like modern day pimping, is you're seeing. The, so you see these girls that are building pages now. There's companies that are organizing the websites so they're better, they're nicer, they're cleaner, they look more professional, they look classy, you know. And then they go find these girls that already have built the social following of, with the half naked pictures and stuff, and then they feature them on this page. So this page now has you know twenty or thirty of these Instagram models all on this page, and they charge seven ninety nine or nine ninety nine. So whatever. what? So I love this would be a decent side hustle. You guys know I love digital it. pimping, right? Yeah. Right. You guys know I love economics, right? I love looking at markets and how things work. Absolutely. So when you look at things like this, where you're selling, you know, either nude pictures like pornography or sex. Um, men don't even come close to the earning potential of women, right? Like, like how much money are men making on these Patreon sites? Oh yeah, where they're, like, <laughs> where they're like, hey, for nine dollars, I'll send you to throw money at. Yeah, you. I, I haven't found any. I haven't found any of those. I've Why been don't we get? Hard, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, could you imagine? Or like porn stars? We should like, start one and just like you know have a competition. Or like, dude, here's the thing. <laughs> okay, nobody's paying for dick pics. Nobody wants to pay for that shit. No? Uh, no, not at all. Like, yeah. male porn stars, half of them work for free. The women make a ton of money. Well, it's sexist. Well, you, there well, needs to be. No, we man, need a law. We need a law before, to pay them equally. The market's flooded with dick. That's true. It is. That's what it is. I now, the, now the, and I agree with that. You made that statement a long time ago on MindPub. Now, the question I have is... Is the market getting flooded with vagina and ass? Is tits and ass becoming like- It is. Is it, is it overwhelming It now? is, but it's also the demand is so high yeah, for yeah, it yeah. that there's always a market for it. But is it flooded? Of course. We could, like, again- It's like gold. Uh, yeah, It'll exactly. There. Yeah. exactly. So Up like, or down, doesn't peaking. matter. It's still it's there. Peaking. Well, uh, here's the example. Still holds more money. Could I sell money? a magazine with random nude models today for 10 bucks? No. Could I sell a magazine with like celebrity nudes? Yes. Could I sell you a magazine of neighbors and people YouTube you grew up with that are naked people? or whatever? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the market's still there. It's just, it's just not the same. It's but changing. definitely no market for men at all. You're not making any money if you're a dude and yeah. you think you're going to sell money if you're. Well, I'd be curious to see because you know personally or barely uh, a market. I haven't subscribed to any of these things, so I don't know. I don't know what it would be like to actually be paying monthly on this. I joke about actually doing it when I was younger, but maybe I wouldn't. Maybe their Instagram is enough for me as a young boy, like that. I would have been like, uh, I don't want to pay seventy ninety nine. That cuts into my baseball card funds every month. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
<laughs> Maybe I would. Nobody collects baseball cards. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> remember, we're talking about old me. You know, oh, yeah, so this yeah, is yeah, old yeah. me back then. So. Oh, no. Well, back then, you would have paid everything. Yeah, you're like, well, you say, you <laughs> say that, sell my King but if you, had, if you have access to the Instagram, I mean, if you have access, access to their Instagram and their whole page is the, like pretty close to nude. I mean, there yeah. it's Instagram allo- allows Playboy nude. Like that, you can be like Playboy nude on Instagram now. Well, you can't. You can't be hustler nude. You can't yeah. be. You can't be hustler nude or girl next door nude. You or, know, or, or penthouse. Yeah, or penthouse yeah. nude. But you can be like Playboy nude on Instagram. Like yeah. old Playboy nude. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean yeah, by yeah. that, right? Like 1950s. Yeah, Playboy nude. Yeah, like, champ- like glitter. Champagne bottles yeah, yeah. the only thing yeah. covering your hoo ha. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh my god, I know exactly the picture it's a you're talking blurry. about. <laughs> yeah. I know the exact nude picture you're talking about with the champagne bottle. How weird is that? <laughs> it's not weird. <laughs> what does that make us? We're like yeah. some kind of brothers? Bo- bosom brothers? Eskimo. Eskimo. Eskimo brothers. No, yeah. no, whoa, Justin. whoa, no. whoa! I don't know. I just know brothers. Gosh, Too far. You know, I like the the Ramon shirt you're wearing right now. Thanks, man. I do too. I thought it came out great. <laughs> Wait, let me see. It makes me want to rock and that's roll. Oh, mind. that's the mind pump one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Why don't dude. I get these new? I don't even. Have, I don't because see. I I requested it specifically for myself, bro. So I just don't even put it out there. I don't even take any more of our shirts. My I have a whole section that is like mind pump map stuff. It's ridiculous, dude. Yeah, yeah I'll never need to buy a t shirt again. Never again. Listen, no. I'm ready to rock and roll. You know, like that's like my mentality these days. So I'm just you know I want to I want to embody that you know for you guys. <laughs> Dude, we were on the same. I knew it. I knew you guys were doing that. Yeah. We both just let's just go for a second, <laughs> like, like whoa, and get real uncomfortable. Whoa, that wasn't uncomfortable. Dude, at all. so I think you I'll, should. I completely own I that silence. You should lead an interview today. Just lead yeah, it. Just dude. go with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We should interview Sal today. You want to interview Sal? Yeah, I think yeah. we should just go with that. <laughs> I thought we were like talking that. about. You guys we were talking interview? about a blog, and we were talking about like uh, Instagram. I'm the easiest person to interview ever. You know what I'm saying? You'd be like, hey, Sal, we, I'm going to do a show where we talk about you. And I'm like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do that all day long. <laughs> it's my favorite subject. <laughs> Dude, so so check this out. I don't know if you guys saw this in the news. I did a, So I did an uh, uh, Insta story post where it's a picture of a butter knife. And um, it's- Yeah, like, I'm not going to lie. I didn't get that one. What that mean? You didn't get that? No, okay, no. So you what's don't know going what's going on. on. No, on I don't okay. know what's going on. It's a, it's a picture of a butter knife and it's got the Union Jack, you know, the UK uh-huh. flag. Uh-huh. And you like, come get it or something. And it like. says, come and take it. So yeah. first off, come and take it. That's a phrase that uh, Second Amendment supporters will say, like hardcore ones. Like, oh, about their guns. Yeah, like, you want my gun? Come and take it. You know what I mean? So we're it's like poking fun at the UK with the uh, butter knife because what because what, they only allow knives no, versus not no uh, because guns? oh so in the, so London first off the UK extremely strict in comparison to the US extremely strict gun laws almost nobody owns guns in the UK except for criminals right so uh, you know just the bad guys have guns which is a good idea I guess um, but anyway. <laughs> So in London, just recently, London's murder rate just surpassed New York City's murder rate. Now, both similar size cities, similar population, all that stuff. Are you serious? But their murder rate just passed. uh, It just passed uh, New York City's. They don't have guns. So the mayor goes on the news, basically, and he's like- The mayor of what? The mayor of London. Mayor uh, Sadiq Khan uh, says- uh, It's a very British name. No, not at all. It's sur- it's it's already illegal to carry a knife that's longer than three inches in public, without good reason. Basically, if it's not for work. That's so short. You get caught with it. Yeah, you get caught Do with they it. Even make them that small? No, they don't. It's like a Swiss yeah. Army knife. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like to clean your nails. So if you get caught with a knife bigger than that, you you get big trouble. So then he does a post, uh, a tweet or whatever, and he says, "No excuses. There's never a reason to carry a knife." Anyone who does so will be caught and they will feel the full force of the law. And what he's doing is he's telling the police to like frisk people who they think have knives on them that are, you know, bigger than three inches or whatever. Hooligans. God, how how hilarious is that? (laughs) You know what though? I think jokes that you have to explain to people are less funny though. Yeah. Well, it's it's (laughs) I was like I saw that one like he's butter knife. I like going through his me. I always go through Sal's memes and I'm like Sorry. dying laughing. And then you I know hit, it's one I, of my I, most- I, I, I tend to always hit one where I'm like, okay, that one I didn't get that one. Sorry, that's yeah. like my jet ski joke. You know, the other day on on the Mind Pump IG, that was bad. The jet ski joke? Yeah, yeah you didn't what see was what it? he did. Yeah, it was, no, what he do? Completely bombed. I was <laughs> I, I was doing a Cossack squat. And it looked like to me in my head it looked like I was jet skiing, and I'm like, it's jet ski season. Get out your sunblock or something like that. Everyone's like, it went, it went way over everybody's head. 
You got no no response. Nothing. 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 Ice <laughs> oh cold. Ice cold. Jeez. I've been on a cold streak lately. So, what do you guys think about this 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 knife thing that they're doing over there? What are they going to do when they when they when murder rates keep going up and people are using like hammers and shit? <laughs> or cars, right? Or other stuff. Well, yeah, first like of all, houses. I thought London is significantly bigger than New York. I thought and that's mm. not true. Population wise, it's comparable. Yeah. Oh, it's comparable. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. London, I think, is the biggest city in the world. Yeah. No, up there. What? Or Hong Kong. Who is it? Who is it? It's definitely not. What is it? Doug, Doug, Doug knows this. I think it's Shanghai. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. I feel like Doug just sent said Shanghai properly. Shanghai. Shanghai. I thought it was Shanghai the whole time. No, I thought it was Shanghai. That's what I thought too. No, Did I saying it wrong, Doug? Or it's Shanghai? I don't know. I'm just trying to be fancy. <laughs> you know what? He pulled the sal on us right there. Speaking of fancy, my my daughter uh, my daughter says she was she was talking and she was making up this accent. I love her sense of humor, and I'm like, what are you what are you doing? She's like, I'm trying to talk in cursive. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? My daughter. She's what? that's hilarious. I, know, I thought that was so she brilliant. Really said that. Yeah, she's like I'm speaking that's in super cursive. That's witty. I'm yeah. like, wow, that is really smart. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, good luck, good luck, London. I hope everybody gets safe. I, I here's the way I look at it, man. If I'm in a city with the, where murder rates skyrocketing, I'm carrying something. So it, I know pepper sprays are all these murders attributed to knives. It's gangs and muggings and uh, whatever. Yeah, well, they got like switchblades. Like, like, what kind of weapons are they? I have no idea. They, they holding. So you know what? There is one place that has the strictest like. It's like you, so old. School. Like the strictest laws. Like no g- knives, no guns, no like super super strict. And they make shivs instead. It's called prison. Yeah, you should see how many people. Interesting. Get, yeah, you should yeah, see how many people get, how get stabbed in there. Happen. Anyway, yeah. so uh, I, there was another article I wanted to share with you guys on sucralose. And it was a study that just recently came out. Which one is Splenda? Splenda sucralose, right, Doug? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate it when you answer. So uh, Splenda promotes, this is a study that was published March 15th, 2018. It is a new study. Splenda promotes gut proto proteobacteria dysbiosis and another big word, um, with Crohn's disease, can't pronounce the word. It's uh, I'm going to try and pronounce it. It's myeloperoxidase <laughs> reactivity. So what they're showing is that uh, if people with Crohn's or something consume um, Splenda, the odds of them getting massive uh, flare-ups is quite high. Um, and of course, they're showing really not good for the gut microbiome. Um, not good at all. Um, and you know, Crohn's being a, a an autoimmune issue, just more evidence that these artificial sweeteners are probably not a good idea, or at least not a good idea for people with potential inflammatory issues. You know what I'm saying? I know, Adam, once you stop drinking uh, artificial sweeteners, what did you notice? with Because you were a big consumer. <laughs> You're bringing this up because uh, what you seem yeah, to be right now. Yeah, I know. Oh, I, no, I know. Oh, oh, I He's trying to set me up right yeah, now, yeah. right? Because I'm in here He's with trying a, to take him out. I have a monster drink today. Wow. Uh, yeah. And He's I paying heard, a little homage to our, our friend, Dr. Lee Norton. Yeah. So my girl occasionally buys these, and she gets them two for $5, and every once in a while she leaves one in the refrigerator. And this morning I was getting up, and I was like, you know what? I just feel like something a little bit different today. I'm going to have a monster cancer drink and so i popped that open i've been sipping on that today so you don't just want cancer you want monster cancer. right right uh yeah no i notice you i notice myself retaining water that's the biggest thing that i notice so i wonder I, if that's from inflammation it could be you know I, I, mean? I don't know i don't know uh so when i was competing like uh the the coke zeros and the artificial sweeteners were kind of the last things that I would clean out of the diet. So I, I would typically, typically take the bigger rocks that were going to make the biggest difference in changing sure. my physique. And then as I got closer to uh, stage, I would start to even cut those out because I did notice like my body responds better when it's not in there. So, mm. but it's also because uh, what the study is showing is that, and there's other studies that show stuff like this also, is that it uh, sucralose kills or weakens or or damages your good bacteria, but then it promotes the expansion of bad bacteria. So it's like a double whammy. Not only is it hurting a lot of the beneficial bacteria, but now it's also promoting the expansion of bacteria that may cause problems, including, and they did this study on, on, uh, on mice, E. coli overgrowth. So <clears throat> not, I, I, I always wonder like with things like that, do you think we are... I mean, and I think I know the answer, sorry, but I, I want to hear you articulate it. Like, do you think it is more risky to have, you know, your Coke Zero, your Monsters, your artificial sweeteners 
when you are in a calorie deficit or if you're in a calorie surplus? Context always matters, right? So calorie surplus, in many cases, not every, but in many cases, prob- may promote uh, inflammation. May y- y- You may not be as healthy. Now, you can be unhealthy with a deficit too, and just like you can with a surplus. So context matters. But I think if you're eating a lot, you're gaining body fat, you, you're not healthy, and then on top of that, you throw artificial sweeteners, it's got to be a lot worse, that's right? What, that's what I think. Yeah, it's got to be a lot worse. Because the way I've always used it, it's been kind of like, you know, this, if I'm not having anything to eat, that's been kind of like, a, this gives me this sweet, like when I was competing and restricting from so much, it's like, okay, it gives me this sweet taste that I just do not have in the diet whatsoever. So <clears throat> I've always thought that it was a lesser evil if I was allowing it in there when I'm in this, you know, calorie restrictive diet yeah. versus, you know, pouring it on with, you know, like you see, which is really common. Somebody goes through a fast food restaurant and then they order a Diet Coke. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're eating this 2000 calorie fucking bomb. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying, especially in, in a meal. Right. I could, I could see that being a big problem. Right. That's what mm-hmm. I'm saying. Because it usually doesn't follow. It's not like many times you consume these things. Well, in, in our world, in fitness, when are people... Yeah, see, there's another one. Sucralose may worsen Crohn's disease symptoms. Duh. We've done this for a long time. You're, uh, many times when you're consuming supplements, which most supplements, are, unless they're natural, are flavored uh, artificially, and most of the artificially flavored supplements use sucralose because a while ago, aspartame was demonized, so they all went to sucralose. So think about the context, right? If you're consuming a supplement that's artificially sweetened, it's either in an inflammatory state because it's post-workout or intra-workout, or um, you may be consuming it with other products and supplements on a, on a regular basis. So that all makes a difference, right? right. That should make a, make a huge difference. I, I think it's it's like the, you know, we're playing charades here with the, right? I don't know if that's the right metaphor. <laughs> 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 it's not like, acted out. We're playing it's not charades. Right What's the, like, the fucking... Uh, Rochambeau? I don't no, know. no, 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 no. Pictionary? No, it's like we, 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 put, we, we find out an artificial sweetener uh, is... Like aspartame, the old switcheroo. Yeah, right. And yeah. then we then we come up with a new one. That's not the game I was thinking of. Though I don't know. It sounds right. Raids. Come on, Doug. I don't know if that's a I real game. I see Doug's brain being racked to there. He's like, yeah. I know I'm good at these games. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Trivial pursuit. Yeah. yeah. So that was a bad metaphor. Sorry, but that was a rampant water. You know, it's like ramps and water. Yeah, yeah, they keep uh, ramping up. And, been no. hanging out with me too much, man. They just keep they just keep replacing it. it reminds me of the same uh, pro hormone or you know designer steroid race or game that we used to play in the supplement. You got it, Doug? Shell game. Yes, Doug. Thank you. Oh. That was the game, the word I was like. You know, I like shell switcheroo. game, not charade game. I was close. Thank you, Doug. I didn't even know there was a, name, a game called the shell yeah. game. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about, but I didn't know that was oh, called right, something. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. What's the Rochambeau? I, I, I feel like that's Rochambeau. rock, paper, scissors. That's rock, paper, scissors. Ro- and charades is the Rochambeau. one where you, you, act out, you act out whatever yeah, you it is you're trying to get them to draw, which is them not what I wanted to say. Why do they call it Rochambeau? Yeah, I have, Google that. I have no idea, but that's just what it's called. But don't you think that's what's happening with like all uh, and you know um, our buddies over with no foods? What's the new the new artificial sweetener now? Oh, it starts with an A. Yes, yes. So I've been wondering that's about the, that. That's the big one. It's Same on the, thing. Allulose. With, uh, uh, yes, Quest. Al- allulose. Quest allulose. uses. I'm wondering like Quest is onto it. How no. they got things to taste so damn good without using all these normal like artificial sweeteners? And so I, I, my prediction is we're going to see some of the similar things uh, that we've seen with aspartame and now sucralose, I think you're going to see with uh, is it allulose or el- yeah. uh, I don't know how to pronounce That's it. That's allulose. It's allulose. I'm sure they're allulose. already like looking for the next sweetener that they can sort of shuffle to once that you know, right. So it's a shell game. As soon as you do that, yeah. we just pull that so out, replace al- it with something. Allulose. Else. I don't know if it's synthetic. It's classified as a rare sugar because it's naturally present in a few foods. Wheat, figs, and raisins contain it. Interesting. 70 to 84% of the allulose you consume is absorbed into your yeah, blood. Yeah, but, but again, what they do is they take it from these natural things, they extract it, and then when we fucking multiply it by yeah, a thousand they, times they, yeah, and, and put it in, yeah, it. process the fuck out of it. Yeah, it's true. And it, you, you have to ask yourself, what you know, was our, our bodies designed to be able to intake a concentrated form of it that much all the time? And maybe in small doses of it, or maybe if you compare it to it at, at those levels, it's not a big deal. But in it, I think over time, as... You start consuming all these foods that have it. I think it's inevitable we're going to be going down the same path that we are with aspartame and the other ones. Yeah. And then when will this end? I mean, how many different, how many hundreds of different types of sugars are there? Uh, 
I mean, there's a lot, right? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different some. things that can make things taste sweet that have less calories or whatever. Really interesting. Uh, yeah, you're, you've got. A, I mean, that's a good point. It's like they'll figure something out. They'll they'll see. Is this legal? Cool. Uh, does it show? You know, are there lots of studies on it? Maybe not. Well, the ones that exist, what do they show? Eh, it might be safe. We think it might be safe. Cool. We'll use that. Right. And yeah. that seems to be the... And, and I doubt we have nowhere near as many studies on allulose as we had on aspartame. Yeah. Well, and it's even, once we do have that many, I bet we're going to start to mm, see some isn't correlation. Isn't stevia already sort of becoming like super condensed to where that's becoming problematic because they're just like using it <laughs> There's a lot. everything? There's, there's more and more processed forms now yeah, coming out a lot of stevia more to make form, it. Yeah. yeah. And even stevia, look, stevia is a, although it's a relatively low calorie or almost no calorie natural you know sugar uh, substitute it's still a plant that has some potential actions in the body right what well, was that mouse study that, uh, well so here's the thing uh, uh, stevia has been used for a long time by you know different cultures so there's different kinds of evidence that you use when you look at or that you can look at there's the how many scientific studies have been done evidence and then there's the how long has this particular thing been consumed by people and what do we see there? Which one is more trustworthy? Well, if you have both, that's the best. But I would, I would, I'm more likely to trust. Like, if an herb came out, let's say a Chinese herb came out, and it's been used for ten thousand years in China, mm-hmm. and you're going to learn a lot about that herb or know if it's safe or dangerous and what it causes because it's been used for a lo- by a right. lot of people historically. Yeah, you can go back and look at the population and how everybody was affected. That's it. And what's what's funny about that is when they come out and take these herbs that have these these, you know, proposed benefits or whatever and side effects that we've known about for 10,000 years and then we study it scientifically, we end up confirming it. Of course, like, oh, okay, ginseng does do this or it doesn't do that or here's the side effects of a like ephedra for example. Ephedra is present in Ma Huang, which is a uh, a natural sounds, like, sounds like I made up. The- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your what? Ma Huang. It sounds like I just made up that word. Yeah, it's it's a that's a, a natural uh, herb that's been used in Chinese medicine for a very long time, and Ma Huang is used for asthma to treat lung conditions uh, because it interacts with receptors in the lungs that opens them up and helps you breathe. And in, in, in fact, uh, it it does this to the sinuses as as well. That's why Sudafed, which is pseudoephedrine. Uh, you know, helps open things up or whatever. It's been used for a long time, but in Chinese medicine, they'll tell you all the side effects. Don't use this if you're nervous, if you're anxious, can cause speedy heart rate. Don't use this for too long. Here's how much you use because they've been doing it for 10,000 years. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Did you see the, po- I think uh, Max, do you, I know you guys all follow Max now. I love Max. Yeah. I know he, he puts out some really cool, my boy. cool yeah. statements and he did one on fat. I, I want to find it so I can, I can plug him. Correctly. Oh, about the process. Uh, yeah. Just like uh, there's, there, there are no bad fats found in nature. Oh. Uh. Yeah. And I think that's such a great statement when you think about that. Yeah. Like the only fats that are bad are the ones that we've, we've fucked with. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. now the ones you do find in nature, oil. you can make them bad by uh, like, for example, olive oil, which is a very, very healthy fat. Um, if you cook with it, it can make it unhealthy because it's not stable. Right. At super, temperatures. Yeah. Certain temperatures. Right? Yeah. So you, you want to eat it, you know, in its natural state, which is just. Yeah. It's his last post right here. It says yeah, uh, saying, yeah. nature doesn't make bad fats. Humans do. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's such true. A, such a great statement. Um, saturated fats are what you want to use for cooking because they're, they're really stable. So the funny thing is back in the day, you do know you what people. how bad lard used to sound to everybody? Like, oh, right. oh, yeah. Like that's one of the you, best. Or you fat, it's like the like, best thing you could use. Right. So if, weird. If you're gonna fry or cook at high temperatures, yeah, lard. That's the that's the that's what you want to use because Dude, it's stable. A lot of these cultures had it right, man. That's right because it's stable. McDonald's used to fry their French fries in beef tallow. Do you guys know that? I didn't oh, know really? when we were kids. When we were kids, McDonald's French fries were you they were fried in beef tallow, and then the story goes. I'm not sure if this is true, so uh, this is just yeah something I remember. So don't worry, someone on the forum will correct you. Yeah, if if so, but uh, I'm usually right. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, a vegan, I'll argue it. Don't a worry. vegan sued McDonald's because they bought the French fries and then they learned later that it was fried in beef tallow. Oh, and so then at McDonald's now, now and for a while now fries their French fries in vegetable oil, and the story goes that in order to keep it so that it tastes the same, they had to add more shit to it. 
to, so that it tastes like it did before. Fucking vegans. So they sued. Fucking it up for all of Why? us. Why? Just because they weren't like full disclosure with yeah. like what they were using? You didn't tell me I was eating. Well, you remember there was a small, there was a kick there McDonald's. what started the, now you have to put the calories up there when people were suing these fast food restaurants for getting fat. Remember that? Yeah. Oh my that was God. about, what, 10 years ago or so, yep, would you yep, say? Yep, Somewhere yep. around there? Yeah, I, I think that's... <laughs> I always found that that's hilarious. That's hilarious, hilarious, dude. It's that you sue a fast food restaurant. Only in California you if you get away with some bullshit me. like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, this body, ugh, I'd hate it. Yeah. Which, yeah. ironically, now that the calories are up there, people are eating more. It's Yeah, it's actually had <laughs> the opposite effect. Yeah, because yeah. people job. people look at the, the menu that's that posts like how many calories, and instead of being like, oh, wow... Um, that burger is 100 less calories. I'll probably get that one. Instead, they're like, wow, if I add bacon, it only adds 100 calories? Cool. Right. <laughs> Throw some bacon I mean, on Imagine it. being the CFO of like McDonald's yeah. when that when they first found out they're going to have to put calories. and like, oh, no, uh, we're fucked. People are going to find out it's tons of calories. And like, oh, shit, we're making more money. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the salad has like more calories than this triple cheeseburger? Oh, I'm going triple cheeseburger. Yeah, I remember the first time I looked up a Jack in the Box salad because back in my early trainer days, Dude, we would do was, shit like that, right? Yeah, it's crazy. And I used to eat eat like the Cobb salad from there and it's like 1700 calories. I was dude. like, I should get the ultimate Jack, dude. It's I, <laughs> I remember, yeah, I remember that when it was at the Cheesecake Factory and I, I looked at the, the breakdown and, and like the, the salad itself, Cobb salad or, or one of the other salads too was like the highest on the menu. Yes. I was like, what? And then you just see these l- ladies just like eating it, like going to town. Like, yeah, I mean a yeah. salad. You know, I've gained weight and I've only eaten, I just eat three salads a day and I'm you, gaining weight. I must have a damaged metabolism. No, you know, this. Yeah. it's funny. We it laugh about this, but this is something that Taylor keeps trying to remind me about us is like, you know, you got to remember to visit some of these things that we think is just so obvious that wasn't that o- isn't that obvious for a lot of it's people. True. Yeah. yeah. That, that you you think that you're going to get a salad somewhere and you think, yeah. oh, I'm Buttermilk making- crouton is probably not a good idea to throw in there. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, no. No. And, uh, you know, you're you're right, Adam, because like, you know, we have... Um, this is this is. I just had this conversation the other day with our our, our team that manages our marketing, our marketing and stuff, and uh, they were telling me to you know that they wanted me to write more blogs. Whenever I write a blog, we get more interaction um, than when some of our other authors write blogs. And by the way, we have some great authors. We've done a really good job picking some mm-hmm. some awesome people to write some good content. And so they want they are encouraging me to write more. And I, I and they tell me like write about like basic stuff like people you think. They were telling me like you th- you think people don't want to hear this because you think everybody knows this, but they don't. Nobody does. Right. So revisit some of these you know these these early topics or whatever because you know what I consider you know common knowledge for me is for these people mind blowing. So I've I've mm-hmm. been doing that and uh, I don't know. Have you guys seen some of the? Ones well, yeah. What's been- one of the last yeah. ones that you just? What's one of the last oh, ones that you just wrote? The one you messaged me on was the the breakdown recovery trap one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which you know early on when uh, when when Doug and I first put together maps and then we're trying to market it. That was one of the first videos I wanted to film. In fact, I think we might have filmed. Did we film a, vi- a video yes. on this years ago? Yeah, old one, that right? was one of the ones you showed me when we first before we even met. One of the first videos that you sent to me was the breakdown recovery trap mm-hmm. video, mm-hmm. and I thought it was brilliantly brilliantly put together, and was like, dude, this is the message that more people need to hear. And it, it hit me home, it hit home with me because I was like, man, this was a lot of how I trained for so many years, and right. I remember when that that, that was a pat- paradigm shattering moment. Train hard, me. recover super hard. Yeah, I remember yeah. when I started coming back off of not or not going to failure and two reps short of short of failure and seeing the gains that I was seeing I was like man it is not about hammering like you think it is and so no it's it, it's a it's a trap a lot of people get and, and mainly because I don't know about you but, but for me I thought recovery meant yes adaptation i sort of yes. I, I thought, thought re- i thought i used to explain to people clients exactly this when you come in the gym you know we break down you know yeah. we break yes. down we yes. tear fibers then when you go Sore home means good right we break down we tear a bunch when you go home you rest you recover you feed and then they they grow they repair they strengthen they adapt like yes, that yes. was exactly yeah, yeah, the yeah. way it, it made sense to me when i was first coming up and, and that's not what's that's not really what's happening. The the well, separate mechanisms. They're right? separate. Yeah, the uh, recovery is healing. So when you damage your body in the gym, when you work out really hard and get really sore, your body aims to heal. Now that damage can send a adaptation signal. And so here's the difference between recovery and adaptation. Recovery is healing. Adaptation is your body uh, aiming to become more resilient to future stresses or 
or to become better at what you do most. Okay, that's what adaptation is. So if I'm you know, sending a signal to my body that says uh, it would be beneficial for me to be stronger so that I don't hurt myself when I keep doing this, or it would be beneficial for me to be stronger because I'm obviously doing a lot of this, and so the body's always trying to be better and more efficient at what you do a lot of, that's what adaptation is. But healing is not that. So you can hammer your body, because this is what I used to think. I used to go to the gym, I'd get, and a lot of people still do this, I'd get really sore, and then I'd be like, okay, I'm sore, so I'm, I need to recover. And then the soreness would go away, and I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm cool now, I'm done. Right. Let me go back and, and work out again and start the cycle over. And what ends up happening with this particular cycle of hammer your body, get sore, wait for it to rest, recover, which usually is about a week or five days or something like that, especially mm. if you hit it really hard. Then you go back to the gym and you're at the same spot. It's like there's no progress. Like, okay, I got sore last week. I feel like I recovered. I, I wasn't sore anymore. Why am I not building muscle? And it was to the point where the argument became, well, maybe you're not fully recovered. Remember that? Like maybe right. you need to rest longer right. in between body parts. A, a, a bodybuilder uh, who was popular in the 70s and 80s, Mike Menser, um, used to talk about this a lot and used to tell people that they just needed to rest longer. And he would have sometimes people hit a body part once every two weeks because, well, obviously you didn't come back stronger. That meant it means you need to give your body longer in between workouts, which is the exact opposite. Oh, yeah. And I remember the first, the very first time I realized that training a sore muscle actually would cause it sometimes to grow and adapt even faster blew my mind. This was the, the I remember specifically when I, when I first encountered this, I was working out, I've been working out for a long time, but I was training uh, to get fit because m me and my family were going to Italy and I hadn't seen my family in Italy since I was uh, maybe 12. So it'd been, you know, at least I think it was like 10 years since I'd seen anybody in, in my, my Sicilian family. And they all knew I was into fitness. They all knew I worked out. They all knew I was a personal trainer. So I wanted to like impress them. And, and, and plus my family really values like physical strength and all that stuff. So I'm like, I want to get really in good shape, but I want to get really lean and cut because I'm going to be going to the beach. And this was the first time I really got myself down to being able to see like a visible, like good six pack besides when I was like a 13 year old boy and I was skinny as hell. And so I remember thinking, I'm going to try training my whole body twice a week instead of once a week. Cause up until this point it was all uh, body part split up until like 21, 22, I would train chest on Monday. I know the exact split. It was chest Monday, back Wednesday, shoulders, excuse me, uh, uh, back on Tuesday, shoulders, Wednesday, arm, uh, the next day, then it was legs and then core if I if I came on a, on Saturday, which I never did. So it was like, you know, one body part a, a, a day type of thing and you rest a week and hit the body part again. Uh, again. So I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try hitting everything twice a week and see what happens. So I started combining body parts. So like Monday would be like chest, shoulders, and triceps. And mm -hmm. Tuesday was back and biceps. And Wednesday was legs. And then I repeat the cycle. So it was six days a week. And I remember going back to the gym and thinking, oh man, I'm still sore. Like my chest is still sore from Monday's workout, is this going to be a good idea to like work it out again? It God, was so that specific split you mentioned has been like the formula for so many years. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I remember I went to the gym. I'm like, I'm still sore. This is so counter to what I thought was, I was supposed to do, mm -hmm. but I'm going to, but what I'm going to do instead then is I'm going to go really easy, which so in intuitively I knew I should go easy. Right. So I went in, went easy, worked out and it was, I was tripping out over the weeks that my body was just, I was building muscle, which was weird to me because I was training my body while it was still sore. And then I started realizing, oh, if I don't go to failure, then I can train a little harder on these workouts. And that, you know, that of course led me to under, you know, training more frequency and all that stuff. And I, then I started to understand, wait a minute, because then I thought, I did this thought experiment with myself. And I've actually given this example many times in the podcast. I thought to myself, okay, what if I hit a body part like crazy hard? Like let's say, I wanted to build my arms and I went to the gym and I did like 45 sets to failure. Like I just went nuts, like just cra crushed my biceps, crushed my triceps and then laid in bed all day long up until the next week to work it out. So all I did was hammer my body and then give my body everything it needs to rest and recover. Literally just lay in bed and drink, you know, weight gainers and eat food and all that stuff. 
And I knew through that thought experiment that what would happen is I'd lose muscle. I knew this because I'd had injured my leg before. I'd had injuries where you couldn't move a body part. And what ends up happening is you atrophy very fast, very quickly. Like put your arm in a cast, do it for a week and watch how much muscle you lose in that week. Even if you work it out really hard beforehand. So I started to put together this idea that maybe recovery, maybe that wasn't really what adaptation was. Maybe that was just healing. And so then I, you know, that's what the blog is about is about, you know, this breakdown recovery trap that people get stuck in and they don't realize that, uh, you know, damage, although that's, that can signal adaptation, um, it's not the only thing that signals adaptation and that, you know, damage, you know, promotes recovery. And if you keep hammering damage, if you keep pushing damage, your body will prioritize recovery. Because think about it, when your body's presented with two options of adapting or healing all this fucking damage that's happening right now, mm-hmm. it's got to focus on on the healing part and you're just not going to progress. I, I still remember when this like light bulb went off for me and it was, I don't know, it was a good 10 years ago or so and it kind of accidentally happened. And I kind of, I remember reading stuff about you know, after your body's recovered, it only takes about three days for atrophy to begin to kick in. And then I thought, well, shit, if that's the case, you know, by day six, I'm already going the other direction. Like it, hitting it once a week makes no sense. If I'm already, if I'm atrophying after three days after recovery, like frequency, I've got to pick that up somehow. I remember reading that. And then I remember it, it fell in a time when I was really, tra- I was training really hard and consistent and I was heading into a two week vacation. In fact, it was like the first two week vacation I'd taken in like my entire career working in the gym industry. And we had just grand opened uh, the Milpitas location, 24 uh, hour fitness. And I had all the time in the world and I didn't have anything really planned to do. And I was on my workout kick. And so I, and I, my buddy uh, was managing that gym at the time. So I would bring my food to the gym and I hung out at the gym like all day. And what I would do is I'd like start off, I'd walk and kind of prime back then we didn't call it priming, but I was like getting my body ready and priming and stuff, get into a workout after the workout, sit down, bullshit with him for a little bit, eat. But I, I basically split like a high volume workout over like three workouts in the day. And I only had two weeks to really do that. And I was pretty consistent for that week. I saw the most gains in my body in two weeks that I'd ever seen before. And it was like, holy shit. And that was kind of when that frequency light bulb went off that I had been I would had been under training so many of my muscles for so long. And that was probably what was contributing to the plateaus that I had been. And I had really seen it really develop and change in my legs because I remember I was always that guy. I could only hit legs once a week because yeah. you went super hard. Yes, because yeah. I would do 24 to 30 sets, you know, wanting to vomit. And, and you got to get your hamstrings and you got to get your quads, oh. and like, like isolate them. And it's oh. like, oh, well, imagine, how, imagine being 6'3, bro. It's a uh, long ways, man. That's uh, a lot of that's a lot of movement, a lot of blood, <laughs> a lot of calories. And you know what sucks about that being in that situation is if you're somebody that doesn't put in a lot of hard work and your body isn't looking the way you want, you're not developing muscle the way you want, well, you can always be like, well, I'm not working out that hard. But, I mean, we're, we're all similar in this respect. If we all want something bad enough, we're going to fucking work. Yeah, work is and not going to be the it's missing not piece. Gonna, yeah, that's not going to be the missing piece. How frustrating is it when, you know, like you, you wanted to develop your legs, they're skinny, you're like, fuck, I'm, you know, I, I want to make these legs grow. So you do what you think is right, which yeah. is go to the gym, work out for two hours, Beat the shit out of yourself, and then your legs still don't grow. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, it's like you're doing everything. You're busting your ass. You can barely walk for three, four days, and you're still not growing. You're thinking to yourself, it'll never happen. When I made that switch over, and it was such an, I went like it's such an easy transition. I just went, I just went, okay, I'm going to start splitting that up over that workout over three days, you know, and it, it felt like I was almost cheating myself. The first time. I remember that. I was too, like, yeah. I didn't even have like a massive pump from it. I I wasn't sweating. I didn't get nauseous. I was like, okay, yeah, you I, didn't need a spotter. Oh, uh, dude. And then, <laughs> then to see my legs just start to balloon up from that, I thought, oh my god, I wish somebody would have fucking told me this a long <laughs> time ago. I would. You know how many leg workouts where stepping Dude. off the curb I fell you know or laying in the gym afterwards or yeah. vomiting afterwards like so many workouts like that you guys bring that up and it's very much from a muscle building perspective like I'm in the gym and you know I'm trying to build muscles and look bigger and like from a bodybuilding like I had the same exact experience but more from athletics, athletics. like we were in the gym all together as a team and I just remember specifically hitting and targeting and isolating 
muscles, which we were doing like bodybuilder workouts. Uh, and then right after that, like the next day we go to practice and do like movement drills. And I just remember being so fucking sore and in- ineffective, like in my <laughs> movements, I was like, I just hated it. And yeah. then like later on, just intuitively, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm not going to like max on this, this bench or this, uh, squat today. And And once I started to do that, it was like, oh, I could move better. And like, you know, my body was responding more. And then uh, I kept doing that. And then on top of that started to, to combine legs. Like, cause just like with you, like I was, we were doing legs all in one day. I'm like, I'm doing cleans. I'm doing back squats. You know, I'm doing leg curls. I'm doing, you know, leg extensions. And I'm like, Dude, my legs were just fucked. That being said, I, I feel like there's more validity to a athlete doing that than a body, but someone who's trying to sculpt their body, right? Because mm-hmm. with you, like building your gas tank and, you know, pushing yourself to failure and stuff like that, it, it definitely, I think it hinders your building muscle, but I think it does serve you at least on- Stretches the, your capacity. Your capacity, yeah. your stamina, your workload. I think it does well for that. So- but if you're a bodybuilder, you don't give a fuck about that. Like I don't <laughs> care about work workload or capacity right. or stamina. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I get get on a, I get get on stage. I get take my shirt off. Like I want to look fucking yeah. badass. Yeah, but still, I would build more muscle. Which right, then, right. You know, like I could carry that into the season. We're doing this in the off season, thinking that um, you know, like obviously, like the endurance portion of it. If I was to kind of push that, like further further into it like closer to actual season time if i timed it right it would have been way more effective it's just it's so crazy when i i mean i'm sitting here listening to you guys talk and i'm thinking and it's so crazy how wrong um the fitness industry has been with a lot of the things that they've been preaching it's insane because it's been around for a little while do you think do you think it's more so wrong or do you think that it's the the message that they want to give because it's what sets you up for the other shit oh no 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 i don't think it's unintentional i think it's intentional right but think about it this way when fitness advice was first coming out built muscle building advice was first coming out they recommended what we talk about on the show all the time they talked about training the body frequently they talked about not lifting the fit i know this because i buy you can buy some of these old fitness books from the from the old timers uh you know old strongmen or whatever and you can i mean they're not great books so not, but i'm a i'm a bit of a, a muscle building historian right i love reading stuff on eugene sando or lewis kyer and all these other you know old timers can you remind can you remind me since you said sorry to interrupt you but you just said something that i i wanted to revisit that conversation that never no, our audience never got to hear because oh, barbell Dr. shrug Andy Galpin. and we're we're uh, we're hanging we're hooking up with galpin when we're in paleo uh, in mm. a couple weeks yeah so. we should do the please whole podcast re- about yes that. yes please yeah. remember to he no he in my opinion is probably the only person i know he's that another knows, historian that knows even more than sal uh, yep. in that in this mm. area like he he's such a great person to get that into that oh, conversation awesome. so, so anyway I, I i you know you look at all these old you know, muscle building books and they're recommending stuff that works. And then it got changed. And I think part of it is, you know, anabolic steroids. Uh, I think the advent, the promotion of machines and equipment, because let's be honest, if you're doing 20 sets for chest on one day, the odds that you're going to want to use machines is going to be much higher than if you did, you know, seven sets, you know, today, seven sets another day, because then you'd end up just picking the, the, the big gross motor movements instead of, you know, all these different machines yeah, and stuff. The more effective ones. So, and, and, and that's what happened. The information was so wrong that you have, what you're listening, you're listening, you're listening to a fitness podcast podcast right now with three guys who have a combined total of something like 50 years of professional, obsessive experience in fitness. And what I mean by that is we weren't just in fitness for a long time. We were obsessed about learning about fitness, both personally and for our clients. Right. And it took me so long to piece together what really works Mm -hmm. and it wasn't because i learned it from these magazines and books and personal training certifications i learned it through my own trial and error and my own ability to to be open-minded because i'm gonna tell you something right now when you when everything you read every imagine imagine this with any other industry everything you read every piece of information you read muscle building fitness personal training certification everything has an agenda when everything you read says train a body part hard once a week when when they all say that, it's like that's like a that's like that's your Bible. Like oh, this right. is you don't even question it. So you have to be 
first off, you have to do this for a very long time. You have to be open-minded enough to do the opposite. It would be like going in the stock market and trying to buy high and sell low. Like that's the opposite of what you've always heard. You know what I mean? It sounds crazy. And so all of us kind of discovered that on our own. And as I think back, I, I, I can piece together all the clues. Like the first time, because I, I can go back even further. I can go back to when I was 21 and back when I had that gym down in Palm Desert. And back then I was taking the, the this was when the, at the gray market, uh, you know, designer steroid market was real big. So I'll take all those things and I get all, you know, I balloon up and get real strong, whatever. And I wanted to get to a 400 pound bench press because I'd never, that was like a big number for me to even, you know, come close to getting to. At that point, I think the most I'd ever bench was like 315. So what I did was is every day or so I'd go and put relatively heavy weight on, not max out, but relatively heavy weight. And I'd walk over to the bench and I'd do like a single or a double with it. So it was like, 70, 60 to 70% intensity. And I did it because uh, somebody that I worked with told me, hey, you know, I have a, a buddy who got his bench press up to 400 pounds and this is what he did. And I thought it was stupid, but I finally said, you know what? I've tried everything else. Like, let me give this a shot. And I couldn't believe how fast I got stronger and how fast my bench press got up. And I eventually think I got up to like 380 or 390 or something. I don't think I ever hit 400. But nonetheless, like there's a clue right there. There was a little clue. Right. And little by little, I started piecing these little clues together, but it was all counter. It was all counter to what we had learned. And I thought to myself, it would be crazy to train a muscle if it was sore. I used to tell my clients, oh, if a muscle sore, don't train it. Like you got to let it rest. Like, mm-hmm. and, and then later on realizing, oh, if I exercise a sore muscle in the right way, it actually, not only does it recover faster, but I get like more out of it. Well, a big one you said earlier too that I think is such a great point and then I remember this piece coming together for me too was, you know, there there's um there's an order of operation and there are exercises that are superior to other exercises. We mm-hmm. know this, right? Mm-hmm. Like a, a barbell bench press just kicks the shit out of a hammer strength fucking, you know, cable machine or like you know, sure. it's just a a it, it's a superior movement for the overall gains and benefits that you're going to get. And so when I used to train like the muscle one day a week, you know, you come in, I would do some sort of a lightweight warm up with something, and then I go into the big barbell or dumbbell type of movement, and then the majority of the rest, of the, and I would like get it, you know, four or five hard sets of that. My chest would already feel a massive pump, and then the rest of the workout yep. was all the bullshit exercises. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're doing you know weird balancing things and cable flies and all the machines, and I'd end up doing twenty sets, yep. but five of them were like the fucking meat and potatoes of it that's right and then i wouldn't get another meat and potato type of exercise until i saw that again next week and what i realized when i started to split the workouts into two and three workouts over the week now i could do on monday you know barbell incline press and then on on wednesday i could do like a dumbbell dumbbell flat press and then on another and so i could start to get these good compound movements i could start to do two three four the real muscle builder yeah the ones that are benefiting the most and when i'm coming into the workout fresh i'm not fatigued so i'm able to lift a lot heavier weight than i was able to if i were because if you go incline bench press barbell and then flat you know bench press and then you go dumbbell by the time you get to them dumbbells you're not doing nowhere near what you're capable of doing because nope. you're completely fatigued that's where the whole mm-hmm. co- that's where i think a lot of part of the reason why Muscle and Fitness and Flex and all these other you know bodybuilding publications, who which were by the way the fitness authorities. They were the fitness authorities for a long time. If you want to learn about fitness, fat loss, muscle building, those were the cutting edge. One of the reasons why they promoted body part splits was because they partnered with machine manufacturers and gyms. And you know Nautilus was created by Arthur Jones. Arthur Jones was like the scientist of muscle building. And he wanted to sell his Nautilus equipment. I mean, here's the reality. If I'm going to go to the gym and do 15 sets for legs, how many of those sets are going to be barbell, heavy barbell squats, right? Four, Mm -hmm. maybe five if you're like really fit. You ain't doing 15 sets of barbell squats. And if you are, you're a beast. Only the first, (laughs) well, (laughs) if you are, the three, the the first three to five sets are the effective ones. The rest of them, the rest of them are kind of a waste. But imagine this. Imagine if I go to the gym and instead of doing 15 sets for legs on Monday, I do five sets on Monday, five sets on Wednesday, five sets on Friday. 
the odds that I'm going to do a lot of squats each time is much higher. Right. And so there's, but and I'm not going to want to use machines. And like, the odds I'm not going to want to do a bunch of different crazy yeah, equipment. You're not going to be as sore. And yeah. it, the odds are the load is going to be a huge difference, which then naturally increases the volume. Which right. to me, that is one of the biggest game changers for. Yeah. But know, think about it. How can you if you're a, a machine manufacturer? How hard is it to sell all these fancy machines when everybody's doing barbell squats, barbell bench press, overhead presses, rows, pull ups? Like when everybody's doing the big like muscle builders, nobody's every those machines are going to collect dust in the corner. But if you tell everybody you need to do you know all your sets in one day, now those machines become very valuable. You know, there, there's a very methodical way about this to continually to see progress and not hit plateaus. And of course, in all their programs, it's all already naturally built into that. But those that are following me on Instagram right now, I'm I just oh, I love that you're doing this, dude, because it's like I can see exactly what's happening to your body. Not because you're posting pictures, although I work with you every day and I can see it. I can see with your workouts because you started out. Where you started out and where you're already at was like a massive difference, but it was a methodical right. And so uh, along those lines, that's exactly what. And, and I'm, I'm meaning to get to this, so and I'm trying to be as as active as possible to share with you guys and continue to provide really valuable free information. It just takes time for me to do these things, and I've been doing it for so long that I just kind of naturally do it. But one of the things that uh, I'm going to show you right now is so I'm about to complete the twelfth workout, which is basically a, a month's worth of training and and the amount of volume now. I'm going to go back and and because I've logged all my sets, sweats, sweats, <laughs> sets, sweats, sets, sweats, weights, and reps, you guys can, I can calculate the total volume per muscle group. And so what I'll do is I'll go back since I've tracked all of this and just, I'm going to use hypothetical numbers right now. So you get the point, um, you know, there's going to be 10,000 pounds of volume on my legs. There's going to be, you know, 7,000 volume 7,000 pounds of volume on my shoulders. There's going to be 5,000 pounds of volume on my arms. Like I'm going to go through every major muscle group and total show the improvement and show the amount of volume that I've, uh, that I've put out in the, in the last month. And now what I'm going to do is the next month is I'm going to make sure I hit that or a little bit over in every one of those muscle groups. And I know just by doing that, and I don't want to go way overboard, which I think a lot of people make that mistake. Like they go after it hard. Like, no, I want to do as little as possible. And this is how you, how you get very, very detailed about this. And what I used to do when I competed, and this is how I could prove that I would. I know that I will see progress every single yep. month because I'm increasing the volume. You, now, your body is prioritizing adaptation and not repair and recovery. Right. You see what I'm saying? And what I mean by that is, I mean, it's always going to re prioritize repair and recovery. But what I mean is, that's not the only. It's it's not such a big signal like heal me that it can't focus on adaptation. It's just enough to send that adaptation signal and then because you're not creating ridiculous amounts of damage it can focus on adaptation and then you're hitting your body again right when it's time to hit it again right and here's another thing you know when we look at these studies of so they measure the signal that uh th there's a signal that you can measure in the body that kind of tells you that your body's building and it's called protein synthesis or muscle protein synthesis and we can test when it's elevated and we see Right after a workout, that shit takes off and it tends to spike at about 12 to 24 hours and then it starts to drop and for beginners, moder you know, intermediates, that usually drops at around 48 to 72 hours. So it's about two or three days where it stays elevated. The more advanced you are, the faster it drops uh, and the shorter it stays elevated. So if you're really advanced and you've been working out for a long time, that muscle building signal might only be super elevated for like 24 hours. In some studies, they show 12 hours. So now you've got things like trigger sessions or focus sessions. This is why we put those things in there and why wow. they become so effective. And I love that we can point to studies that show, I remember like like putting this together and then seeing more studies come out and just confirm it even more. And I'm like, well, no, that's why the, the stronger, more fit I become, the more the trigger sessions become of value, whereas in the beginning they weren't as valuable, but now they make such a big difference. I also feel I I also think that people have the same patterns that they have like with nutrition as they have with like the way they train. Like you have these excellent week or two that you put together and then you kind of take a step back for a week or so. And that's kind of what keeps you at this level plateau. And if you were actually tracking and breaking it down mathematical, I bet you'd be surprised that you're 
doing about the same amount of volume. But in your head, you feel like, fuck, I was getting after it. You know, I've been getting after it really hard, but then you let off the throttle or you miss or you you can't quite reach the amount of volume that you reached because you had to travel or this or that, but you're still getting your workouts in and you feel strong. So in your head, you think, why am I not seeing the results? Well, it's like, well, what you don't realize is, you know, last last month you did a total of amount of volume of this much, whatever that number is, and this next month coming forward, you pretty much did the same thing. It was just spread out differently. You know what I'm saying? Math- it was just mathematicals are off. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's, <laughs> it's I don't know when when I started to track that, um, and I remember this with my peers when I was competing. Uh, you know, at, at Bernal, there's a, a lot of pros inside that gym. In fact, in, in any other gym I've ever been to, there's more pros in there. And a lot of the guys all work out with each other. And a lot of times they'd want to work out with me. And I I just didn't like working out with everybody because they still train this way. They yeah. still train beast mode and to failure. And I would and I would razz them about it. I said, listen, I'm not in the business of proving that I'm good at working out. I'm in the business <laughs> of proving that I can change my physique. Mm-hmm. And to me, jumping in a workout with you where I'm 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 going into my workout, I know what I need to do. I know what I need to do today to mm-hmm. elicit elicit change in my body. And I want to do just the right amount to do that. I don't got nothing to, I don't want to get in a circle jerk with you three right. and start getting into a who can lift it's more all ego. Yeah. Right. And like pushing each other till we fail. In one ear, not the other. You know why? Because they identify so strongly with being a martyr for fitness that when yeah. you say to them, Nah, man, I'm not trying to just go overboard and go crazy. In their mind, they're like, well, I'm a fucking badass. I stay until five in the morning. Yeah, that's why I do it. In reality- Cool, bro. You're good at working out. That's why you'll still be (laughs) the NPC as I go all the way up to the fucking pro level. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's exactly what I'd say. In reality- make them so angry. Yeah, Yeah, sure. sure. And in reality, here's the deal. Do you want better results? Do you want to see- I just We just got tagged- I just got tagged on Instagram by uh, a listener who done body part splits for a long time. He was in that breakdown recovery trap, listened to our podcast, and he's like, I finally took a leap of faith. And it's funny because it is a leap of faith because I remember Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being so attached to, oh God, what if I lose muscle that I was afraid to change anything, even though reality, now I know, now it's like, who cares? I'll change something and for two weeks it doesn't work, I go back, I'll be fine. But back then I was so afraid, like, oh my God, if I train my chest three days a week, it's going to shrink because I'm not letting it recover or whatever. This guy does this post, and he, he was afraid of the same thing. Dude, if I didn't get sore the next I would, like, abandon it, you know? Like, it, that that was the old mentality. It's like, if I'm not getting sore, I feel like this is just Waste. an ineffective, yeah. like, a totally ineffective approach. And so I would abandon, like, really solid programming because well, it was like, you know, I, I just don't – I didn't see long-term in, in the success of it. Well, no, this guy – I'm going to see if I can find his uh, – maybe you guys can check him out on uh, on Instagram. But he, he did this, and I can't find him. He did this. He started working out more frequently, stopped trying to go to failure all the time. And he's like, my, he goes, my chest was never responded. It was like the weakest body part. He's like, it's growing every week. I am blown away. He's like 30 something. He's been working out for a long time. I like seeing that the most. Yeah. I like seeing beginners respond. That's always awesome. That's easy. But yeah. Yeah. We, we all know that's easy, yeah. right? Yeah. Helping me to help a beginner. And that's why I think that's probably the problem. Because a beginner comes, hires some trainer, or gets some information from somewhere of doing this program or do this workout, and they just do it. And of course, they see results. Mm -hmm. Of course, they see change. You know what I'm saying? You're new. So that becomes the formula from then on out. Yes. And then you marry it. How often did you guys see this where somebody has trained a certain way or followed a regimen or did or fell into CrossFit or fell into a modality of training. Well, that's saw, why they all exist. And that's why there's a whole tribe around it. Because and why there's initially, a cult around it all works. Of because, yeah, it gave them the... It works well, so well that it was the best shape they ever... And I know this, too, because I fell in the same fucking thing. I remember that... You know how many years... I was training to six reps. You know, six reps was all I like. It was like yeah. heaven. If we did, you read somewhere, that's the yes, yes, yes. Only muscle building yes. amount is six to the to the point where if we ever did a weight that you could do eight or ten, we almost thought that was a waste. Yeah. Like I'm not Jane like, Fonda. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like I'm not that. trying to look like a chick. I don't want toned <laughs> arms. I want massive arms. Like yeah, don't you, give me those green and pink weights. Right. You know I mean? So every set you were going as heavy as possible, and I'm I'm failing at four or five and having my buddy spot me yeah. to six. You, you know, know what's saying? crazy yeah. about this? This? You want to know what's years crazy? I did that. What's crazy about this is we're all in our, you know, uh, we're all in our late thirties. I'm close. I'm getting close to forty now, right? My body was in its peak naturally, probably sometime in my early twenties, right? That's probably when you had the most potential. God, if I only knew. I know. If I could go back in time, all new levels. Oh, we dude, could have achieved. Oh, if I could go back in time, you'd be like, dude, you're doing everything fucked up. 
here's what you need to do with your nutrition. Here's what you need to do with your training. Yeah. I don't I don't know what I would have done. Right. It would have been great. Uh, hey, you know, Katrina to this day, she yourself. always Money. always yeah. gives me a hard time. She's like, it's so unfair how fast you can change your body. You just she's, know what to do, man. Yeah, I'm like, that's, I've just yeah. figured it out. And she's like, and I feel like I'm working so much harder than you. I'm like, well, sometimes you do. You know, <laughs> Sometimes you work harder than you need to. You know, yeah. she's got, she's there now. Like she gets it. But, you know, I've learned now, you know, that there's just these little subtle adjustments. And every day I'm making little adjustments. I'm making little improvements every day, being a little bit better version of myself. It doesn't ever feel like it's taxing. doesn't ever feel like it's really hard or difficult. It's easy to stick to because it's just a little bit more than what I was before. And I just, you can, there's it's such pe- a parallel there to business too. I don't want to take us off topic, but so true. It, it's just like, that's exactly what I've learned. Like efficiency, oh. you know, over like the martyrdom of, of grinding and, oh, and just living, you living know? at the gym. I used to do that. Yeah. You just live there. Like, I, I mean, shh, I mean, it is, there's something to that though. Like initially when you get started, especially as a personal trainer and you're trying to like learn the skill of, of like just being there and like immersing yourself in it full on completely but like yeah when you go to try and work on your body and and you try to take everything on you take everything on you keep taking it on and then it's just like you burn out and you burn out quickly and it's the the results that you initially got the first couple weeks that's that's where it stops boom you're done yeah people attribute they when people think hard they think uh, like it sucks. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I love it when I tell people what I do and they're like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, oh, you know, I have a podcast, this and that. And they're like, man, that's, so you really don't have to work that hard, right? And it's like, well, I mean, I enjoy it. So if you think that hard means it sucks, yeah, my job is not hard at all because I love what I do. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's all about effectiveness. It's all about being smart. I mean, you could, we could eliminate, you know, you could use a backhoe to dig a hole in your backyard and that would be far easier than using a shovel. Does that mean I go with the shovel because it's harder and it's making me sweat more and I'm working more? And No, not at all. It's, it's far, far less effective. And if you train properly, if you understand that, there's, that your body can prioritize recovery over adaptation, if you understand that and you understand that you're, you may be stuck in the breakdown re- recovery trap, move yourself out of that. Watch what happens. You'll be shocked. You'll be blown away. I'm, I'm saying this to somebody who... I mean, I had trained already for years before I figured this out, and I thought my body wouldn't go anywhere. And I mean, I did more with my body, uh, totally natural, than I did when I was taking those, you know, designer steroids or over-the-counter, you know, pro hormones. Mm. And it was all because my training and diet were were smart. Back when I was doing those other things, it was all over the place. It wasn't intelligent at all. My now body I know we had we had no idea where today's podcast was going to go, and sometimes those are my favorite, especially when we do something like this because. You know, it's been a while. We we do so many interviews. We have so many quads now that uh, it, we used to when we first started. We used to tackle a lot of these like real basic type of things that we haven't addressed in a really long time. And it's, do you remember the last time that we brought this up? Like, I don't even remember the last time no, that we no. talked about something like this. And when you talk about like the biggest paradigm shattering moments of my, my fitness career, like this is one of them for sure. Like this completely shifted my ability to not only see better results in myself, but then also to be a better coach and trainer. Yeah, and it client. translates to your beginner or somebody just starting, but also your experienced lifter. So like, you know, we were in a space where we knew what we were doing. Well, like Sal said, I think it, I think it translates even, or is even better for them because a beginner, you really can throw almost anything at a beginner and their body's going to adapt and change and see results. But it's the guys and the girls that are grinding day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out of training that have been kind of about the same. Like, are you, you know, sure you're, you've been in a little bit better shape or you've been in a little bit worse shape than where you currently are right now. But when was the last time that you would really dramatically mm-hmm. changed your body? Mm-hmm. And it's you know, the ultimate kind of get people out of the rut. Yeah. You know, once they apply this, if they haven't before, it's such a game changer. Do you guys remember applying these principles to your clients and how big of a difference it was. Well, the irony. I was way better about applying this to yeah. my clients than I was myself. Dude, I remember learning this early on as a trainer where it's like, wow, man, if I hammer my clients super hard in the gym and they can't walk, I used to do that all the time when I was, first became a trainer because <laughs> yeah. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Yeah. And I used to find get pride in it. Like oh, yeah. clients the next day, I'd be like, I would so, get clients from being bro, known as a hard I trainer. I don't know if it's still this way. And I know we have a huge trainer base that listens. So I would love to hear feedback uh, you know, via DM or whatever on this. But that was a fucking epidemic when we were oh, coming up. Yes. I mean... Trainers used to brag about it. Yes. And I managed trainers for many years, most times 20 to 30 on staff. 
all of them like were like this. Like m- like at least ninety five percent of them trained clients this way, and it was such a hard habit to get them to break yep. because it was it turned it into this competitive competitiveness, and then the clients perpetuated the problem because yep. they would bounce from trainer to trainer. Like I would get clients that would come to me. I remember being really frustrated as a boss getting these these type of clients that would come in. And they come in, they see me in my office, and they sit down and say, hey, Adam, you know, you know, I really like Melissa. She's great and everything like that. But, you know, uh, can, is there any way I could train with another trainer? And I'd be like, yeah, you know, what? what is it? Uh, why, why is that? Like, what do you want to train with somebody else? Well, you know, I just, I, th- I think she's, you know, because she's a girl, I think she's too easy on me. And I'm just not seeing, she's not getting me sore. Oh, God. You know, could you give it? And it'd be great. I'd give them with somebody who would just break them off be like, thank you no they would be and i could be, barely walk yeah. yes and i'd be like ah, oh, yeah. you're killing me you know yeah, like yeah. but i mean that's that's the the issue so Dude, i don't know if it's still that's how i got that's how i got doug that's how i got doug as a client we said we he literally came in and he was experienced he'd worked out for ever long time since he was a kid and i told him well we're going to work out twice a week and I'm going to train your whole body. And he looked at me like I was crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's a good thing I'm a good salesman because I convinced him. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and then it, I remember, like, I, I remember like it was yesterday, Doug, you would come in and we'd add 20 pounds to your deadlift or 30 pounds to your squat. And the look on his face was like, did, are you sure I did 20 pounds last, th- last week? And I'd be like, yep, I wrote it down right here. Like you yeah. just added 20 pounds to your lift. Over like over the course of four days, and Doug, I want to ask. I want to ask you because you because you were somebody who was chasing this a long time by yourself, and you're you're not you're just some little spring chicken. Obviously, <laughs> definitely you, not a spring chicken. Right, right. You've you've, <laughs> you've just, tried. You're, this. you're still springy though. What were yeah. uh, and and I know you've stroked Sal off, so we don't need to go about Sal. More about you and what sure. what more you, like a winter hen. You know? What you what you. <laughs> Like when you started training with Sal, what were some of the things that blew you the way the most, like as far as your body starting to change and seeing results? Well, I'd been at a standstill for quite a long time before I started working with Sal. I'd worked out, you know, since I was like 16 years old. I'd done all types of workouts and I would put on some muscle early on in my experience, but then it just kind of stopped for like 20 years. <laughs> and so when I started working out with Sal, I'd kind of given up on the whole concept of building muscle. I thought, well, maybe I'm just a hard gainer. I'm never going to get the body I wanted to to build, you know, the Rocky three body. Yeah. <laughs> that was the one I was shooting for. And so anyway, I, I kind of lost interest in, in working out and building muscle partly because of that. So I went back and started working with, with Sal, thought I'd just give it another shot and started to see the the results in my body, and I started to exceed where I was before I started working out with him. What pieces of that did you do you think were the most attributed? I know there was a lot of things because, of course, the programming was dialed and the things you're doing. But do you like remember like I never had someone tell me to stop at failure, or I never had someone? Yeah, absolutely. There were all types of things that he taught me that were counter. Yeah, counter to what I'd learned. Right. So yeah, stopping before failure was one of them. Uh, you know, again, training more frequently. He had me working out twice a week, which really, to me, I, I really thought that was not going to be enough. But I was working out the full body twice each week. And I did that for probably almost two years. And mm-hmm. before that, were you running like a, a split and working three, four, yeah. five times a week? How, many, how often were you lifting before? Well, yeah, when I was really into it, I was working, you know, five, six days a week. And oh. I was following like muscle and fitness. In fact, I subscribed to mu- muscle and fitness when I was like 16 or 17 years old. And I would read these workouts and I'd say, oh, well, I'll try this one because the last one didn't work. And they were all the same, of course. They were all very intense. They were splits. And I just didn't see any results on any of those. Wow. And then I realized now in hindsight, looking back, that it was because I was, number one, probably overdoing it each time. Number two, I wasn't working the body parts as frequently as I should have. Yeah. And then also, I was taking everything to failure. Yeah. Every, I mean, I had a spotter. I work out with friends. And we take every exercise, like, for example, bench press. We'd be doing those last couple reps, and I wouldn't be lifting half of it. I had my spot helping reps. me. Forced <laughs> reps. Every every set. Yeah. A forced rep, thinking that's what's gonna cause my body to to grow. Right. And it was totally bunk. Because yeah. you have to damage the body. You gotta create more damage, right? And that was all and, you, it, and he did I kept him on two days a week for about a year and a half or two years. And the reason why I kept him on because he would ask me, should I add more should I work out more more frequently? And I'm like, Well, no, you're progressing still. Like he was progressing on a very and the funny thing is Doug was convinced that he was a hard gainer, 
The reality is, now I've trained lots of people. The reality is, Doug is not only is he not a hard gainer, Doug is on the upper end. I mean, he's a, you know, he was able to pull uh, you know, over 400 pounds at a body weight at 150 That's crazy. at the age of almost 50. So arguably the strongest one here. Yeah. But pound for pound, <laughs> yeah. pound for pound, that's why we call him the chimp. Uh, but no, no, all joking aside, you know, it's funny. And then he took pictures later on and was all shredded. And it's like, you thought you were a hard gainer. Not only are you not a hard gainer, but you're kind of a badass. But yeah, his body was progressing. So it was one of those things like, well, if you're, if you're progressing, let's keep it at this. And then we'll only add more when it's, needed. when it's needed and when necessary. Do you know another thing that I would, I would never do that I do now all the time, like speaking to frequency and the importance of it and how important it is, is I would never work out in the past unless I was going to go crush it. Yeah. Like, so I would not. It was a waste. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I used to think that way that, like, if I was just not feeling up to it, just not in the mood, maybe I'm tired, maybe I'm groggy, maybe I'm just, like, not in the mood to just get, and I, because I, ha- I th- always thought I had to kill it, you know, or go to failure and do that, that if I didn't have the motivation to go to the gym, to get after it like that, then I wouldn't go at all. Where I'm completely the opposite now. Many times, not in the mood, don't feel the greatest with that. Eh, maybe I only do five sets of something. That's mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll do that. Like mm-hmm. I'll totally do and I'm I and I'm comfortable and okay with that. And I just I pick something that I think is really important for me. Like, oh, that's a, you know, I'm gonna get the most bang for my buck just going and doing five sets of squats. Like five sets of squats is a decent workout. It's a hell of a lot better than absolutely nothing that day. And I send that I send that signal again. And it, it you know, I never did that before. And that was a big game changer for me too, is just learning that I don't have to always get so motivated to go to the gym and to go in there and get after it all the time. In yeah, fact, you don't have to win your workout. Right. And in fact, and I <laughs> yeah. still see this, right? It's I like see a fucking I see guys talk I see guys talk about this stuff all the time about, you know, oh, you know, sometimes you just don't want to lift and it's the guys that get in there and just do it anyways and this and that. And I'm not saying there's not a place for that. But I, I am saying that, you know what, sometimes that's your body telling you. Like you're fucking tired. You know, you're probably o- you're overdoing it. You're burning the candle at both ends. And maybe you don't need to go in there and hammer it and you don't feel like it. So don't not go in at all. Go in and maybe take an easy workout, mm-hmm. right? Go real light on everything. Like don't try and go to failure. Don't chase a crazy pump. Just get some sre- just get some sets and reps in and leave. And the other yeah. thing too is that's cool is that when I started implementing trigger sessions, uh, I noticed that they were so effective at producing energy. Where, you know, I, I'd be like, oh, I should probably do a trigger session. I'm kind of groggy and a little tired. And then I'd go do my five to eight minute trigger session. Afterwards, I'd be like, I feel yeah, energized, like man. Recharged. Yeah. In fact, I was on years ago. This has got to be now. How long have we had the podcast now? Three years? This is a, uh, about two and a half years ago. I was on Smart Drug Smarts, uh, which is a great podcast. And I was talking about trigger sessions as a way to boost your cognitive function and creativity because I noticed that. When I did a trigger session, like I could think sharper, I was more awake, it's producing more of that dopamine, producing more of those, you know, feel good chemicals, I don't feel so fatigued. Um, so you actually, you actually, so when you are feeling tired, you go to the gym, you go easy, you'll find that you'll, you'll end up creating more energy. Right, right. Yeah. Good stuff. So hey, that, that blog that you did write though, is that, that's, I know I read it already when you first sent it over to me, but is that live now? Is that, or do we actually have it out? should be live mm. on our website. That's mindpumpmedia.com, and there's a blog. Well, we'll put in the show notes, too, Section, right? put in the show notes. So, but we have a lot of blogs. We've got some good writers that put some good, put pretty good content. So then maybe what we can do is do a link to this blog, and then maybe Jackie can also do a link to that page that has like all the... I know there's it's, a, it's our reference page, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that right? Well, There's a blog page. Yeah, it's oh, it's called a blog, blog page. There's a tab on the website Casey was for saying blog. Something else. Yeah. No, no. It's a, and if you have any suggestions for articles that you would like to see us write, uh, let us know. Said so you, you can either DM us or message us through our website, um, and we'll make sure to do those for you. Well, maybe what we try and do more often too is that because I mean, again, we're seeing the, a large response from the the blogs that you write. You know, maybe when we see the ones that kind of outperform and do really, really well as far as shares and eyes on them, maybe we'll do a episode uh, about it also and start doing that more often because, you know, we don't get a chance to do this very often where we just kind of rift and go and talk about some of these paradigm shattering moments for us that we had in our career. I know we're, we're, we're interviewing so much or answering questions from our qua. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's good to revisit some of these things that I think, because personally, like when I talk about the things that 
have made the biggest impact on my clients and the people that I've taught or trained. Like mm-hmm. the this is this is the nuts and bolts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Like, the, like, yeah. like teaching them these little it pieces. all revolves around, and it, it doesn't cost you guys any money. You like take take the information for what it what it is. Use it down. I mean, read the blog. I mean, read the blog. And that really that's the only thing that I ask people is like, man, to help mind pump out. The best thing you possibly do is you, you read that blog. If you find it informative and it helped you out, share it, man. That's the biggest thing that I can ask our audience to do is, and that that to us gives us an indicator that that was if you guys are sharing it a lot then we know that okay this is a good topic for us to maybe address and talk more more towards perfect thank you for listening to mind pump if your goal is to build and shape your body dramatically improve your health and energy and maximize your overall performance check out our discounted rgb super bundle at mindpumpmedia.com the rgb super bundle includes maps anabolic maps performance and maps aesthetic Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.